So for five days, a man was borrowed. The story that Travis Walton and five other witnesses told was so unbelievable, so unimaginable, that it has become the most famous case of UFO abduction ever reported. There's no time. O'clock. Hey, it's episode 86. Travis Walton. Yeah, we actually don't do a lot of UFO-themed episodes, but this was actually yeah. your idea, wasn't it? This was yeah. something you came up with. Yeah, most of the UFO kind of cases are not long enough to do a whole show on. There isn't much there. Yeah, that's true. But uh, And a lot of them aren't that interesting. They're kind of samey. But this one kind of sticks out because uh, if this is a hoax, it's it's a good one. That's true. Yeah. This is one of the very few that uh, other people have corroborated parts of the story and things of that nature. Yeah, and it's a it was a group of guys that uh, saw a UFO, and the UFO evidently killed one of their friends, and then he came up missing for, what was that, five, six, seven days? And they almost took a murder charge behind it, but then he reappears with, uh, with the story, you know, that he was up on a UFO. Yeah, this is actually the case that the movie Fire in the Sky was based on. Right. Yeah, and, even and- though the movie was uh, wildly exaggerated. Yeah, and it, what was weird about it is that it's been a long time and the story's pretty much remained consistent and a lot of the witnesses that were in the truck that night that saw this happen weren't close friends. They were only worked with each other for, you know, a little while. Pretty weird case, but we'll get into it. We'll, we'll get down to the bottom of it. Yeah, before we get into that, let's do our regular shout-outs and stuff like that. Be sure to check out our latest movie review, which was John Carpenter's The Fog. Yep. What I've actually done, um, someone on YouTube asked me if I, for some reason, I don't know why I started doing this, but when we first started doing the movie reviews, Mm -hmm. I basically just made them YouTube videos and put them up on YouTube and that was it. They never went up as podcasts. Yeah, they never went up just uh, as audio podcasts. And so I had a couple of people ask me, it's like, hey, why don't you put the movie reviews up? as, you know, audio only files that they can access through podcast apps. So I finally got around to doing that. Yeah. And there was another subscriber that made a comment about uh, In the Mouth of Madness and other John Carpenter films. So I looked up In the Mouth of Madness and um, Cheston's in it. Yeah. So I went ahead and got it on Blu-ray. Yeah. So that, yeah. Yeah. So that'll be, uh, that review will be upcoming. Yeah. I actually wanted to tell... (laughs) <laughs> Cheston. No, I don't right. even know if they even know who I'm talking about. Charlton Heston is yeah. Cheston. Well, okay. Cheston. Okay. Yeah. Um, speaking of movie reviews, I actually kind of wanted to tell this funny little story. Uh, you know, a couple weeks back, we reviewed Roman Polanski's The Tenant, right? Yeah. Well, our friend, Demetrios, uh-huh. otherwise known as DJ Leviticus, he yeah. DJs at our goth night here in uh, downtown Orlando, Memento Mori. Yeah. And he's a very good friend of ours. And he had actually, he was into Roman he's, Polanski he's a good He's a good friend, but he won't play any requests from us. Ain't that some <laughs> shit? Yeah, he does. He plays Vicky <laughs> okay, Lego. Right. He, play, he even played like Death in June and stuff like I that. I wanted like to play on. Death in Rome. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, he didn't like it. Yeah, he didn't like it. He but, didn't have um, a good taste. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so I was talking to him earlier about The Tenant because he had started watching it. So we were kind of talking about it. And then we were talking about Roman Polanski movies and he was talking about The Ninth Gate, yeah. which I don't remember what year that came out. It was like late 80s, early 90s, something like that. It was a Roman yeah. Polanski movie. And Johnny Depp was in it. And Dimitri's like, he said something about Johnny Depp. He's like, oh, funny story about Johnny Depp. Dimitri's dad used mm. to run, it would may still run, mm. a, a video store uh-huh. in Miramar, Florida, back in the 80s. Right. And this was when, and that's where Johnny Depp lived at the time. And oh, this yeah. was before he was famous. Like, okay. I think it was even before he was on 21 Jump Street or anything like that. All right. So, evidently, Johnny Depp would come into this video store that Demetrius's dad owned mm-hmm. 
And he said he mostly rented Scarface. It's like he rented Scarface like over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he and he Scarface. said, and he said there was another one too. He's like, it might've been Death Wish, but I'm not really sure. Yeah. But he said he, he would just <laughs> rented Scarface a whole bunch of times. Mm-hmm. And he's like, and one time he rented it and he never brought it back. Oh shit. And so there was like a big thing. Yeah. And he's like, and Dimitri says to this day, yeah. he's like, every time my dad sees Johnny Depp in a movie or on TV, <laughs> he says to the TV, he's like, you you owe me $29 peckerhead. <laughs> and then Dimitri right. says, and yeah. then he says, and then I always ask him, Do you, are you going to charge him? He's like, is that with the extra uh, yeah. dollar charge for not rewinding yeah. or whatever? Damn. And I was like, and I told him, I don't know if he knew what I was talking Johnny about. Johnny Depp doesn't return his movies. Yeah. Damn. Well, at least not Scarface. Not he wanted want. to keep that shit. Damn. But, uh, I told Dimitri, I said, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but um, if any of you have seen the wonderful 1985 movie, Better Off Dead with John Cusack, and there's a running gag in that with this little newspaper delivery boy who's like a hood, Mm -hmm. and he comes to John Cusack's house wanting his $2 like for the newspaper delivery that week, and he doesn't have it. So the whole rest of the movie, this kid is like chasing John Cusack going, Mm -hmm. I want my $2! And I was like, that just like reminded me. I was like, I pictured Demetrius' dad on a bicycle like chasing Johnny Depp all over the world. I want my $29! That's what I thought of. And I told him earlier, I said, I'm totally telling that story on the podcast. Yes, because that's hysterical. Oh, um, I did that NPR thing. Yeah, that's right. In case right. you guys didn't know, NPR is going to do a, uh, a show about Mammoth Mountain Poltergeist. Yeah, that's right. So they're going to take uh, my witness testimony and pl- put it to music, evidently. I don't understand it. But I have never heard one of these shows. Evidently, a lot of, a, a lot of books and a lot of people have done these shows for NPR. And uh, the woman that runs or that makes that show... Red Mammoth Mountain Poltergeist, and she was like, "Oh, I got to get this guy on." They sent me to this uh, to a local uh, professional recording studio. Yeah, here in uh, Winter Springs. Yeah, it was funny. It's like where they record rap albums. So we walk yeah, in there. Well, and, it was hip hop, and then there hip-hop. was some alternative rock and stuff. Yeah, like that. you walk in there, and like the the endo just hits you. Like, bam! <laughs> it's like, damn, Bob Marley must have been hanging out in here. <laughs> so I'm in there, you know, and I'm I'm doing the. Uh, it takes me like a good. 20 minutes to get warmed up doing those kind of interviews. I think I start, I think I started out kind of weak, but they're, they're going to call me back if there's not enough material there to do it again. I think there probably will be, but you know, it's like, you don't want to give the whole book away. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you did tell a lot of the major stuff that happened. Yeah. Which yeah, you I have did. on other shows and stuff. I, well, I started so. to get kind of kind of annoyed though. Ax, you know, I kind of started to get annoyed towards the end though. She kept asking me like how I felt. It's like weird. Well, you don't ask men how they feel. Like men don't know how they feel. You know? We don't so, feel anything. Yeah. So how that feel? It's a man. Leave me alone. God damn it! I told you what happened. Men, men, are, uh, men are uncomfortable with their yeah, feelings. Yeah, men just <laughs> men just tell you what happened. All right. You're supposed to infer how it felt. Don't be asking men about how this shit feels. Shut the fuck up. I'm straight, man. Like, don't ask me how I feel. Like, I, <laughs> see, now that just confirms everything I've ever suspected. All men are sociopaths. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, we, you know, we have reactions and we do things based on what we saw and what happened, but we don't sit around and analyze how that shit felt, man. Well, Come I on. think they kind of want it how to... How do you feel? You know what I mean? <laughs> how do you feel? You know? Well, it is kind of, Well, the thing is, maybe she's kind of feeling like... She's trying to get some emotion, emotiveness. Huh? Well, and plus... You know, people that might have read the book, right? Since you didn't write the book, right? Maybe she's trying to get some extra stuff that wasn't in the book. There's no bonus, man. That, you there's, know, there's I'm no, just saying that yeah. that might have been some okay. of the justification. Yeah, because you know, shit, I was like 13. I can't remember how I felt. I just told you what happened. I got freaked out, you know. Yeah, That's as, as you would be. You right. Know. Yeah. Um, anyway, so let's see. What else do we have to... Oh, okay. So if you would like to support the show, I know I say this every week, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast or go to our blog at 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com and there's a link in the sidebar to a PayPal account. Also, like to give a shout out to our two newest patrons, Valtrina and Elizabeth. Thank you very much. I was actually, I should have put you on there on the show last week, but we had already recorded it by the time you signed up. So I didn't get to. So now you're on this week, but we're mentioning you now. And also we got a new PayPal donation from Daniel D. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. Show, any, the show's grown fast. Yeah. Now. As soon as it hit, like, as soon as it hit 1,500 subscribers, it started to really grow. And then it hit 
what, 2000? And now, now it's like almost 2,200. We're almost getting like, uh, we're getting like a hundred new subs a, a month, which that's nothing compared to some of the, you know, like really super mainstream shows. Yeah. But, you know, our show is, is an underground show when yeah. you think about it. This is like a, like a little click or something. Well, and honestly, I would rather have a smaller show with, with just people that were really into it. Yeah, you know, dedicated uh, subscribers that yeah. actually interact with you. We're getting a lot of interaction. People ask us questions. We, 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 we shit, we watch movies with some of them. Yeah. Who is that? That who is that? We were watching a movie with, and I was, was messenger messenger her. Trina. Yeah. Trina. Yeah. How you doing, Trina? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You guys were talking yeah. on Facebook, and he about was about Saturn three, and, and he was taking pictures of me sleeping without yeah. my eyebrows on, taking yeah. pictures of our kitten in the sink, and all. Kinds yeah, of stuff. she's and yeah, and she was uh, <laughs> asking about Prometheus. She bought almost every movie we uh, suggested that she didn't have it. She's like us. She's rebuilding her Blu-ray, con- you know, collection because yeah. DVDs going out, you know. So, and I got I got the Die Hard collection today. All five movies, twenty five dollars. See, I didn't Blu-ray. even realize that there were five of them. That's how out of the Some loop of them are I new. Am. I've never seen them. I think I've only seen two. Yeah, I think I only saw the first yeah. two. Yeah. Oh, and Blade, I finished the Blade series. Blade 1 and 2 were awesome. Blade 3 Trinity. God, that shit was an abomination. It was like climbing Mount Everest to get halfway. <laughs> I got halfway through it and I was just I just can't take this I didn't shit. Watch I just it. can't I take this shit it. anymore. I turned it off. Damn. I turned it off. And it was the extended cut. Yeah. That was all that came on the Blu-ray collection. And they said the extended cut is worse than the theatrical cut. Yeah. And I, I agree. That there needs to be less of that. <laughs> I'll I'll have less of that, please. And what sucked is that there's a girl in it I know. Yeah. Parker Posey. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because, you know, I kind of came up with her in the same crowd in Laurel, Mississippi, you know. My friend, my friend, um, uh, Joey Reuter, lived right across the street from her. I ran into her in uh, New York later on. I was I knew her brother too. Her brother, her twin brother is really cool. She's got a twin brother. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I've only seen. I haven't seen her for a while. I used to see her like in a bunch of indie movies back in the day. Now she's saying, you know, what's funny is that she's like a, a really good person. She yeah. was always a really good person. She always seemed super cool. Yeah, she's not like a typical like uh, Hollywood style. You know, super corrupt and. You know, nothing. Yeah. Well, no, like I normal. said, she started out in indie movies. She's yeah. mostly been in indie movies. I don't even know if she's been in any, like, big, huge. No, I think she married a guy who makes indie movies, and she's, like, in the indie scene. Yeah. And she really is that good looking. She was always that cute. So, yeah. And her brother was, like, the male version of that. Just as good looking. They were really good looking people. Wow. Her dad owned a uh, local Chevrolet dealership. Oh, okay. Yeah. See, I didn't even know you knew that. I yeah, knew, I, knew I knew you knew that other uh, that other actress that Marilyn Rice got. Yeah, that well, was I dated her now. during high school. That was yeah. my girlfriend. That's right. What's it? What show was she? Twenty four. That's right, right, right. I've never seen it. You know, I've heard about it. I sound guilty. You know, I feel kind of guilty and never watched it. I don't it's care been on it. like forever. Yeah, me and Mary Lynn go way back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all were in the same crowd. That was a, that was the Michigan crowd though. Yeah, you know, when I was hanging out with them. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I guess that's enough of our shout out and yeah. shout outage. Um, okay, so like I said, when we're doing the news story now, and I usually try to find something that's kind of related to the topic that we're doing at hand, and I found a perfect thing. So this story came from the April second, twenty eighteen issue of the British paper The Express. And it deals with, evidently, I'm not really up on my UFO lore and everything mm. like that, but evidently this guy, uh, or this disappearance, was like super, is super famous in mm. UFO circles. His name is Granger Taylor. Mm. Now, evidently, this guy, he was like kind of one of those like crazy geniuses, like mm-hmm. he could build all this stuff. Like I think he even like dropped out of school and stuff like that, but right. he was like really good with technical shit and he could like build engines and just build yeah. all this kind of stuff from the ground up. Now he had built, one of the most famous things he built was, uh, it kind of looked like a UFO, mm-hmm. like it had furniture in it and stuff what? like that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I don't know if it was meant to be a spaceship or if it was just kind of like he built it as like a fort or I don't know mm-hmm. what it was. But evidently, this is in British Columbia, by right. the way. Evidently, he had been um, building all this stuff. And then after a while, he started to tell his parents that he was in communication with aliens mm-hmm. and that he was going to go and join them. Okay. Right? Damn, there's a lot of that shit going on. Yeah. Now, in 1980, yeah. when he was 32 years old, he disappeared. Mm-hmm. 
Okay. And now in UFO circles, mm-hmm. they say, oh, there was no trace of him and stuff. Mm-hmm. They never found him or anything like that, which is sort of true. Mm-hmm. But evidently someone is making the reason why this was in the news recently is that someone is making a documentary about him because mm-hmm. he seemed like such a fascinating character. He was like a genius, but, you know, he's kind of he had all these weird ideas about talking to aliens and stuff. And yeah. then he ended up disappearing. It's kind of reminded me of Heaven's Gate. Remember the Heaven's Gate call? Yeah. He didn't cut his own dick off, though, did he? Not that anyone those ever at, said, no. Those dudes at Heaven's Gate did. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Or they leave dick. that out on a lot of things. They leave the, that out. On a lot of the uh, things about them. So maybe it's better not to talk about that. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Damn. But yeah, so this guy, so they're making a documentary about him. They said, you know, we don't want to make a documentary about him like, oh, look at this nut job or anything like that. They said, we just think he's a fascinating character. And, uh, you know, and we think that other people might think he's fascinating as well. So since all these UFO sites say, you know, no trace one was ever found, you know, and they're kind of implying that he got into this purpose built spaceship that he had made yeah. and took off <laughs> yeah. to hang out with the aliens that he'd been talking to. However, uh, evidently the March 31st edition of the Montreal Gazette from 1986, mm-hmm. which is five and a half years after he disappeared, said that they found two pieces of bone that could have been his. They were definitely a uh, human bone and parts of what was, was thought to be his truck that he had gone up there in. Damn. And it was in a dynamite blast site. Oh. And also there was evidence that he had taken some dynamite from his uh, parents' house, or I think they owned like a junkyard or something right. like that, that he had taken it and gone up to this uh, mountain. I think it's called Mount Sicker. Uh, wow. Maybe he blew himself up. That's what I'm kind of thinking. Right. Now, the weird thing is that <laughs> If you look on... Think about that. Yeah. I'm going to blow myself to, to kingdom come. Yeah. And yeah, everybody will think of spaceship. So the report from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police yeah. says two pieces of bone were found at the blast site and a pathologist confirmed they're a human until further evidence is found the RCMP is assuming they are tailors. Yeah. However, now the Wikipedia entry on Mount Sicker has a mm. paragraph about this. It says... He, it calls Granger Taylor an unconventional genius and UFO fanatic who had mm-hmm. built a small saucer, quote unquote, about 15 feet wide on his parents' junkyard property. Mm-hmm. He left his family a note saying he was going to travel on an alien ship for a 42-month interstellar voyage. <laughs> and he and his pickup truck were never seen again. Damn. Many years later, local newspapers reported that a logger on Mount Sicker spotted a crater in the ground and metal debris embedded in a tree. Yeah, it blew himself up. It is believed that Granger was carrying explosives in his truck at the time of his disappearance. Yeah. Now it says the Royal Canadian Mounted Police reported that the debris contained a VIN number matching Granger's truck and yeah. that it was an apparent suicide. However, yeah. the RCMP in recent interviews have confirmed that the report of his truck fra- fragments being located is a spoof. No, really? Meaning that someone made it up later on. Okay, so they did A new find documentary his truck. being filmed, which is the one I was talking about in the news story, has proven no trace of him or his truck have ever been located. Wow. So I don't know where wow. the truth lies there. Okay. Because some of them say, yeah, they found two pieces of, bo- of yeah. human bone and parts of a truck. Yeah. And then a later RCMP report says, no, we never found anything. You know this? You know what this reminds me of? What's that? There was another case that was like this. It was kind of a gifted guy and he was learning to be a pilot. He was going to be a pilot. And uh, one day he's flying his little Cessna around and he uh, sends a transmission back to the control tower saying that behind me is a UFO. You know, and he's trying to, it's shining a light on me. And then it's got me. He's gone. Never found him again. <laughs> I like that yeah. sound effect. <laughs> yeah. It, it, that's what they heard over yeah. the radio. <laughs> <laughs> and they never found that guy. But they think what happened was, is that he committed suicide. And spoofed his suicide or made his suicide look like a UFO abduction. Yeah. Because why wouldn't you do that? If you're yeah. going to kill yourself anyway. Might as well just, yeah. That's a good idea. I mean, they you know, if you're maybe, that way inclined. They thought that maybe he didn't want to upset his parents. That he wanted to die, but he didn't want to upset his parents. So Right. So he wanted to make it look like, look like he got just got taken by taken aliens. And, he and was, maybe he was still alive maybe somewhere. Maybe he was still alive somewhere. Yeah. Aww. That's I I kind of like that because I remember that in the transmission they heard a noise yeah. in the background while he's talking about the UFO that's tailing him and it's above him and they think it's the sound of the banging door of the aircraft of him jumping out no that he had the door open or, or unlocked oh, right. while he was talking and just getting ready to jump out just like a second or so after they heard that noise that was his last transmission. 
Yeah. Jumping out of a plane seems like a pretty yucky way to go. And it might yeah. not kill you, depending on where yeah. you landed. It right. might just bust you up bust really you up pretty good. bad. They've actually had the stewardess blown out of those damn aircraft at super high altitude. But she hit on an angle yeah. on a bank. Yeah, that's of right. I've heard that story. She lived. Yeah, yeah busted. She was busted up. But busted she, up pretty but bad. She lived. Well, terminal velocity is only about 110 miles an hour. Yeah, you I mean, if, if you fall into like some trees or like some yeah. thick snow or something like that, it's. I've come off that motorcycle at 75. Now, yeah. it's, not a, it's not an instant stop. Right. Like hitting the ground. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're, you're rolling. Well, you know, if you hit the backside of a slope, it can slow you down. Yeah. Especially if there's a bunch of nice vegetation or snow, but you'd be busted up. And if it was snowing out there, you'd probably die of frostbite before somebody got to you. Yeah. That would yeah. suck falling out of a plane. Yeah. And then... remember, the one, remember, the, remember the hoax? I think it was in 2008 or 2009 where they a family was called for help saying that their baby crawled into the fake... UFO balloon. Oh, that's right. I and forgot they about that. And that balloon down for miles and miles. That baby wasn't in the balloon. The baby was in the house. It was yeah. just a hoax. That's, yeah, that's right. Why did they do that? Wasn't it some kind of like... Some type they of reality to... TV show. Yeah, that's right. They were trying to get advertising for something. They or... got sued, I think, or well, charged. Yeah, yeah think. it was some kind of stunt. That Telling everybody that the baby was in that little 15-foot UFO. It was just a balloon. <laughs> <laughs> I had forgotten all about They this. said that they had the balloon out in the front yard, that it was a decoration, and the baby got and in the baby it, got in and, and somehow and it the tethers off. broke, and the baby was in the oh, balloon. Oh, no. Save the baby. <laughs> Jesus. All right. So, Damn. anyway, let's get to our main topic today, which, yeah. of course, is the very famous Travis Walton UFO case, otherwise known as... As fire in the sky. Yeah. They made a movie out of it in 1993. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I haven't seen the movie for a long time. But I do remember that uh, UFO enthusiasts were really not happy about the movie because it is super, super exaggerated. Yeah, Travis said that too. He said yeah. it wasn't accurate. He just let them do what they wanted to do so he could get his paycheck. Yeah, pretty much. I yeah. mean, you know. I don't okay, blame so, him. yeah. All right. So this happened in... November of 1975 in Arizona. Now, Travis Walton uh, was 22 years old at the time. Yeah. Uh, he was a logger. And it so happened that he was employed by Mike Rogers, who would actually eventually be uh, become his brother-in-law because he was dating Mike Rogers' sister at the time okay. named Dana. And they would get married later. So Mike Rogers, he had a contract with the uh, U.S. Forest Service for, you know, various jobs around, you know, the forest in Arizona. And basically what this job was, was they had to go into this particular forest, the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest in Arizona, and they had to go and clear out a bunch of brush and branches and stuff like that, like, because it was a fire hazard. Well, it's funny because when they ever show, when whenever they show this forest in a movie or in a reenactment, it looks like the Sierra Madres or something, or, you know, it looks like it's up in the mountains in California. It's in Arizona? It is, yeah. Because Arizona would be very sparsely uh, wooded. I Although think. it's funny because I was watching a, um, uh, I was watching Travis Walton giving a talk about this. Uh -huh. And one of the first things he said was that, uh, was that it's funny that people are always surprised that he's like, you have forests in Arizona? And he's like, there yeah, there's in national forests okay. in Arizona. All right, I was wrong. Yes, yeah, so it was like a forest fort. I know, because when you think of Arizona, See, you just think it, it looks like the moon, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, desert and stage brush. Like there. And... Yeah, but there are forests there. Okay. And they were working in one. So there was Mike Rogers. He was like the, the boss. And then Travis Walton. And then there were other dudes on the crew. Ken Peterson, John Goulet, Steve Pierce, Alan Dallas, and Dwayne Smith. And these guys were all from a town called Snowflake in Arizona. Now, Mike and Travis knew each other very well, like I said. The other guys, not so much. Like, one of the guys had only been on the crew for, like, three days or something like that. So it wasn't like they were all, like, super body-body or anything like that, which is kind of an important uh, detail. So it's November 5th and they had been working overtime because they were afraid that they weren't going to be able to finish the contract, you know, in the time allotted because mm -hmm. it was a lot of work. So they'd been pretty much working 12 hour days, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So this happens about 6 p.m. They're leaving the, you know, the work area and they get into Mike's truck and they're going to drive back to town. Right after they started driving home and 
Travis has said in numerous talks, he has given numerous talks at UFO things and all kind of different stuff. So there's all kind of interviews and stuff like that with him on the internet that you can on YouTube and stuff. And he has said, look, he's like, you know, I know that people might have accused us of being tired because you've been working all day or drinking or whatever. He's like, the, none of that was the case. It's like, yes, we had been working all day, but we were all, you know, still very alert. Uh, none of us have been drinking because obviously we've been working. None of us were on drugs, nothing like that. So he's like, we're driving in the truck and they see this bright light coming from behind a hill. So they get a little bit closer to it. And then they said that they all saw a large silver disc hovering over a clearing and it was like shining really bright. Yeah. Um, they said it was about 20 feet in diameter. That's not very big. About eight feet high. That's pretty small. Yeah. He said, now, when they first saw the light, they didn't really think much of it. Like, he's like, it wasn't a kind of a thing where we were like, what the hell is that? You know, he's yeah. like, at first we just, it was just a light. It wasn't that weird. But then we kind of saw that. So then Mike stops the truck and they're all like, we're going to, we got to go check yeah, that one out. Of the you stories know I mean? I, one of the stories I remember them saying is that they thought it was a helicopter at first from a distance. Yeah. And then when they saw it, it was like uh, two upside down kind of diamonds. And it had panels on it and a black frame. It, had, it was like a black fuselage with big panels that lit up. One guy said it looked like a brand new Corvette, real shiny. But uh, I didn't, I don't remember. Space rem Corvette. Yeah. That but, would be badass if aliens made but, some shit to look but, like a Corvette. But 20 foot in diameter is pretty damn small. Yeah, that, that is small. That's too small really to even be manned. And later on, Travis's story about, you know, being revived on a table and chasing things around and finding a control room, that couldn't have happened inside a 20 foot in diameter ship. Unless they were just saying that it looked like it was 20 feet from far away. Right. Maybe. It had to have been bigger than that if yeah, this story think. is true. It's hard to tell how big something is if it's in the air. It's not on the yeah. ground, and you don't really know what that object is. I mean, you know it's not a car. You know how big a car is. You know how big a bus is. Yeah. But if it's a foreign object up in the air, it's hard to, hard to get a good idea of how yeah, big it is. Yeah, especially if it's kind of, I mean, it seemed like it was sort of far away. I mean, we see, blimps, we see blimps all the time. Yeah. But blimps come in various sizes, so you don't know if you're looking at a little blimp or one of the huge ones, like a Zeppelin. Remember, you know, you know how we go down to the club in Orlando sometimes, and we'll see that damn Goodyear blimp-looking yeah. thing? Yeah. I don't think that's very big. No. You look at it, it's got patterns going on it. Although that one we saw one night, I think that was like a different one than we usually saw because that one looked totally weird. I, mean, I bet if you put that blimp that we saw and put that next to something like a big old Graf Zeppelin or, you know, or the Led Zeppelin or <laughs> <laughs> Or Let's the, put it next the to Led Zeppelin. Put it next we'll to the Led bigger. Zeppelin. Put it next to the Hindenburg. <laughs> that thing would disappear next. That thing would disappear next to an airship. Yeah, it probably air. would. Yeah. But yeah, so so Mike stops the truck, and then Travis jumps out of the truck and runs toward the shit. Yeah, well, I'd do that. Yeah, you probably would. I would. I'm yeah. just like, I guess a lot of people are thinking like, what a weird thing to do. No, I'd like, do that. wouldn't you be scared? But like, yeah. I'd go, an alien fucking spacecraft. I'd I'm going to go I'd look run. at that shit. <laughs> hey, 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 come, hey, come here. I'd be waving my arms. Come here, man. Come on. Because come on. It, you want to talk to the, the chances? You know, what are the chances of it actually being hostile? It's going to run based on all the stories yeah. we've already heard. Or I'll, it might be like, hey, what's up, bro? Yeah. What's up, Earthlings? Based on all the stories I've heard, I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not afraid of uh, alien spacecraft. I, I'd like to meet with them. Yeah. Or at least I'd like to have them see Well, like see I said, me. if they were if there were hostile ones, they could have just blown us up by now. You'd yeah. think they would have done it a long time ago if they hated us that much. If they were hostile, we'd never have seen them. They, we would never would even see them. They would just put some kind of a pandemic on the earth and just well, wipe yeah. us out. Nanites. Right. Something like that. That's yeah. what it seems like. It's like, why if they're going to even bother to show up at all and show their faces or show their ships or whatever, then I don't... Yeah. Then, then it's something that's interested. Yeah, or they're either interested bit. or just mostly indifferent. Yeah. So, okay. So, he's... He's running toward the thing and all the guys are yelling at him to come back. And then evidently all the other guys in the truck said that as soon as Travis was nearly underneath the disc, mm -hmm. that it started making really loud noises like an engine. Mm -hmm. And then it started wobbling from side to side. And Travis is like, oh, maybe this isn't such a good idea after all. And kind of turns around and starts to walk back toward the truck. Now, they said as soon as Travis starts to walk away from the disc, all the other guys see like this kind of aqua colored, like blue green light coming out of the disc and hitting Travis like a bolt of lightning yeah. or like a death ray. I don't I, know. What I always is. heard it described as a bolt of lightning, an arc. Yeah. An arc of lightning. Yeah, it may but be. there's no telling. I okay. mean, one of the... Usually he says a beam. Sometimes yeah. he says an arc. 
So I don't know if it was like, woo, like a yeah. death ray or if yeah. it's like lightning or what it was. Do that sound effect again. Woo. There you go. I don't know if I did it right the first time. Uh, <laughs> I, I tend to cut this kind of a little bit of slack, give it some leeway, because if you have a bunch of witnesses, those witnesses are going to describe any event in a different in way. In a different way, of course. It happens with every single with thing everything. that's ever happened. Ever. I, eyewitness testimony is, in general, shitty. It is, yeah. Something yeah. happened. Yeah. You saw something in the sky... Travis ran out, ran out there, and he got hit by something. By something, some kind some of light. Some kind of a light or an arc or something. Apparently, when this light hit him, the men saw Travis's body rise about a foot in the air, and then his arms and legs went outward, like mm -hmm. outstretched. Then he shot back about 10 feet, and he was like evidently suspended in this beam. That's kind of what they yeah. described. I've heard alternate descriptions. Right. One of them, it looks like a lightning bolt that hit the ground at his feet and it blew him up into the air like a, like a hand grenade explosion. Yeah. Well, I mean, like you said, That's... if they did see this, and I'm not saying one way or the other, I don't right. know what the hell happened. You know, it, you're not expecting it, obviously. Right. So everyone's going to see it in, in a different, different because way. it happens so quickly, yeah. evidently, that something you weren't expecting, something that happened that fast, you're just going to get the briefest of impressions yeah. of it. My, my personal experience seeing shit blown up and having lightning bolts strike right next to me and seeing artillery strikes and hand grenades exploding and blah, 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 I've seen all that shit. Most likely, based on the witness testimony, it was probably something like an electrical arc that hit the ground and made a big pop and he was thrown into the air. Yeah. Probably that's the most likely. Yeah. Because that's the least dramatic. Yeah. All this stuff about, you know, levitation rays and beams stretching guys out, less likely. Yeah. And that's kind of what they showed in the movie too. Right. Now, evidently after that, he kind of fell to the ground limply. Mm -hmm. Now, th most of the other guys, you know, according to their later testimony, they pretty much straight up said, because this was kind of a bone of contention because people were like, why did you just leave him there? Why didn't you go look for him or anything like that? Most of the guys said, you know, just the way he fell to the ground, what happened, we thought he was dead. Yeah, I remember him saying that he he was thrown like a rag doll and when he hit the ground, he just basically hit like a sack of shit, that he looked like he was dead. And I know what that looks like coming off motorcycles and I've seen other guys come off motorcycles. When you hit, when they're unconscious, when they hit the ground... They hit like a sack of shit. Yeah. It's weird. So they just assumed that <laughs> he was course. dead and they yeah. were freaked out and scared and stuff like that. So they basically just took off. They were yeah. like, man, he's dead. Let's get out of here. And so at first the guys are like, they called the cops from uh, a place called Heber or Haber, Arizona, which is kind of near Snowflake where they were from. And they called the cops and all they said to the cops at first was that one of the crew had gone missing. Yeah. He So then they all meet the sheriff at this one place. And the sheriff said that all the guys were like really upset. Yeah. You know, and the, like even two of them were crying, like right. evidently, because it was this horrible event. So that was when they told him what happened. They're like, look, we saw a saucer. There was a light and it just hit him and stuff like that. So then the cops go back Mike and the cops and everybody like that, they go back to the spot where he disappeared. And evidently, there is no trace of him. There is no body. There is no... Was there any impact burned. zone where the thing hit, where, where an arc hit? Apparently not. Apparently not that, that I ever heard. They right. said it just looked like nothing happened. Right. Um, you know, his there was no body there. There was no, like, burned grass. There was no right. anything. Okay. So they thought this was very strange. Now, because there was nothing there, the cops started to get suspicious. Because, look, there's no physical evidence. Mm -hmm. Now they're starting to think that maybe these three guys, like, either accidentally killed Travis or murdered Travis and are using this UFO story as kind of like a cover-up. That's what a cop would assume. Right. Which is what, I mean, that's probably what anyone would assume. Right. Now, they're I would assume, like, if I was a cop, I'd assume either that or they're playing a hoax, which that's yeah. the two most likely scenarios. Right. From a cop's point of view. So now they're like, well, we have to, if this dude is still alive, we have to find him because evidently it gets very, very cold at this in this part mm -hmm. of the forest at the time of night. And it's like he only had like a jean jacket and some jeans mm -hmm. on and shit like that. So it's like he'll probably freeze to death if we don't find him. So. Actually, we're getting to the halfway point, so let okay. me take a break right now, and then when we get back, we will continue the story of the Travis Walton UFO incident, the fire yeah. in the sky incident. So we're going to take a break, and we'll be back in just a minute.
Okay, and we're back talking about the Travis Walton case. Yeah. So, so they're, they're in police custody, right? So over, yeah. yes. And over the next couple of days, evidently the whole area around where that crew was working was searched, mm-hmm. right? They had cops, they had helicopters, you know, everything. And they couldn't find shit. Now, at this point, the stories kind of started to go. It's in all the papers. It's even mm-hmm. in the international press and stuff like that. But just mostly because here this guy disappeared and they said, hey, a UFO probably took him, right? right? And there's a bunch of dudes that, you know, will testify to this. So they start getting like all these UFO people like showing up in Snowflake and asking questions about it and shit like that. So this one guy named Fred Sylvanus, I guess is how you pronounce his name. He's from Phoenix. He's a UFO guy. And he comes to Snowflake on Saturday, that which is November 8th, and he records interviews with a couple of the guys, with uh, Travis Walton's brother and um, one of the other dudes that was there. And some of the stuff that the guys said on the recordings kind of came back to bite him in the ass a little bit later. It's nothing really all that terrible, but evidently Dwayne Walton, who was Travis's brother, admitted that he and Travis were super into UFOs and that they had even said, oh, if we ever see one, we're going to go run over and check it out or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So that kind of negated a little bit because later on they asked Travis Walton, did you ever have any prior interest in UFOs? And he said, oh, not really. But evidently when he was missing, his brother said, yeah, we were super into UFOs and had been for many years. Yeah, that's it. That's Right. That situation, though, you know, that's easy to kind of misunderstand that. Yeah. I might say, oh, yeah, I'm super into UFOs, but I'm not really super into UFOs. Yeah. And then later on, I might answer that that same question in a different way, just depending on how you're feeling at the time. Yeah. So I can understand that that might be a misunderstanding. And I think most people would run to a UFO if it was down close to the ground, I think. But I think it's probably it about half and half. I yeah, mean, I think half would probably run away because it was scary. But like the other yeah. half might be like, hey, what the fuck is that? Maybe it's more, maybe, maybe more than half would go to it. I'd run right towards it. I don't know yeah. if I would or not. I, I guess I, I, I probably would. Yeah. I think I probably would. I'd go, look at that. Let's go look at that. And you'd run yeah. over there. You know, you'd come running with me. <laughs> Let's go look at this thing. We're going to say okay. hi to the aliens. Let's go look at What's this thing. That? Yeah. So yeah. evidently at this point, you know, the town marshal of Snowflake, whose name was Sanford Flake. Really? Is Weird. that his real name? Snowflake and Sanford Frank. Yeah. I don't know. Was the town named after him, kind I of? Don't I don't know. know. But he evidently thought the whole thing was a hoax. Although, like I said, they didn't know where Travis Walton was. Then there was some stuff with Travis Walton's mother. Um, she apparently did not really like talking to the cops. She reportedly didn't seem terribly... Not, like, not that she wasn't upset that he was missing... But I think people expected her to be more upset or like she didn't react as much as they should have. But, you know, then some people said, oh, later on, you know, she was crying and stuff like that. It was just when they first came and told her about it, they thought that she didn't react the way they expected her to. Uh, They're always saying that. So they kind of feel like, oh, maybe she's hiding something or maybe she knows where he is or something like that. It's like when you like when they accuse that young couple of murder over there in Italy. Well, they're not acting right. They're not acting like they're being accused of murder. Remember those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the thing. You never know. It's like, yeah, you know, 75 percent of people might react in a specific yeah. way during under certain circumstances. But the other 25 percent might react totally differently. If you think a person's guilty or you just hate a person, you're always going to say they're not acting right. That's that, really yeah, what it's that's about. that's true. Yeah, whatever your preconceived You're notions sure. are about what they did or didn't do. Right, yeah. Then, yeah, every, then everything they do, it's, it's, it's oh, just, it's not... kind of like that study where they yeah. found that, like, if they, if you get put in a psychiatric hospital and people think that you're crazy, then anything you do will be considered you're evidence of cra- your crazy, crazy behavior. Yeah, and you're Even if even it's crazy. just normal shit. Right, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. So there was, we should do a show about that because I read a book yeah. about that one time. It's super interesting. But so anyway, there's this other guy uh, from, another UFO plate thing called Ground Saucer Watch and his name was William Spaulding and he said hey if Travis ever comes back I have this doctor and we'll take him to go see this doctor uh, and we'll have him checked out and see if the aliens did anything to him or anything like that and he also told them and I was like well I don't know why he'd ask him to do this specifically but he's like oh tell him to save his first urine sample after what? he returns they want to see what the aliens were feeding what the al- I guess so yeah. so I was like that seems like a weird thing to think of but okay. maybe maybe they think that the aliens <laughs> gave him some drugs yeah 
Interestingly, at the at this point, the police are either trying to figure out, is this a hoax? Did they murder this guy? Did this guy die accidentally? Do they know where he is? So on November 10th, they all took lie detector tests. Yeah. They this were, is when it gets interesting for yeah. me. These were administered by a guy called Cy Gilson, who worked for the Arizona Department of Public Safety. Now, the questions he asked, they ba- he basically asked, um, did any of you harm Travis Walton? Do you know who harmed him? Do you know where he is? Do you know where his body is buried? Did you tell the truth about seeing a UFO? Stuff like that. Now, evidently, one of the guys, his test came out. Uh, he didn't finish the test, so it was considered invalid. But all the other guys that took the polygraph test, the guy administering it said, I think they're telling the truth. Like nothing, you know, right. nothing came up that suggested that they were lying. So whether or not they knew they, but evidently they saw what they said they saw, or they believed what they said that they believed. Yeah. And it, an, another interesting thing about this story is that these guys on this work crew don't all know each other that well. Yeah. It's not and like I think, they yeah, I mentioned it. that earlier. Yeah. One of them was actually had only known him for a few days. Yeah. I think one of the guys, I can't remember which one it was, but one of them had only been on the crew for three days. So they yeah. didn't know him very well. So that's kind of odd because if you're going to concoct a story and make a hoax, you're going to have only guys that you know real well. Yeah. And that everybody's in on that it. Everybody's in like, on it. Like why would some dude you only knew for three days, like want to get in on this big hoax with you? Yeah. And even though he was only with them for three days... And, and then this happened. To this day, decades later, he stands behind this story. Yeah. And to, to, to me, that gives this story more weight. Yeah. At least the object in the air part of this story. Yeah. You know, the what happened inside the saucer, I don't know. Yeah, that's... Well, that was only one guy's well, say-so, so, and that's kind of a subjective right. experience. So I don't really know anything about that. Right. But we'll did get these into guys, that, Yeah, but. did these guys see something in the woods that they didn't really know what it was, and they couldn't explain, and then something bad happened to Travis Walton? They seemed, seemed so. They seemed to believe that that was the case. Right. So, meanwhile, Travis Walton comes back. He basically says... He's been gone for five days... Yeah. Nobody knew where he was. I yeah. think they still don't know. And they all they were almost getting ready to charge these guys with murder. Yeah, they That's well they thing. were kind of thinking about yeah. that. That was one of the reasons why they gave them polygraph tests, like to right. see if they knew anything about where his body was or anything. Because like cops that. the cops weren't buying this story. Right. Well, why would you? Right. <laughs> it's pretty outlandish. Right. So Travis Walton comes back. Now he ends up near this gas station in yeah. Haber, Arizona. And he says he doesn't remember how he got there. Right. So he goes to a payphone. He calls, I think he called um, his brother or something like that first. And then he was like calling the cops. I think it's hey, pretty back. natural to call your family first. That's well, yeah, of course, you, because, you know because you know that they're worried about right, you yeah. and stuff like that. He doesn't really know, I guess, like what the course of the police investigation is or what has happened, what has been happening in his absence. Evidently, when he first calls, he thinks he's only been gone a couple of hours. He doesn't know that it's been five days or so he says. Now, at first, when he returns, they're trying to keep his return on the DL because like I said, the press has been all over this story. So his family are trying to not let it leak out that he's back yet. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, later on, we'll have to tell everybody, but we're trying to kind of keep it. And the police were trying to keep it under wraps too, just so they could, you know, continue with the investigation. When he comes back, they take him to this quote unquote doctor that this Spalding guy from the Ground Saucer Watch or whatever has yeah, set up. The Ground Saucer Watch. Ground Saucer Watch. That's okay. a great name. Okay. So anyway, I don't know if that's still around. This is the not. hypnotist, right? Yeah. Okay. So they were thinking that it, this was a real doctor. He wasn't. He was right. like a hypnotherapist. Right. right. Now, there are conflicting versions of this story. Now, according to the Walton family, Travis and Dwayne and them, they said, we went to this guy's office, found out that he wasn't a real doctor, like a real medical doctor, and we were only there for about 45 minutes because we were saying, hey, look, what are your qualifications? What am I doing here? And stuff like that. But evidently, Spalding and the doctor, whose name was Dr. Stewart, Lester Stewart, he said that the Waltons were there for over two hours. Okay, so I don't know what the truth of the matter is. Now, by the time Tuesday rolled around, Travis, well, the fact that Travis had returned had leaked out to the press. So, of course, everybody's, you know, kind of trying to converge on him. Then there was uh, all this other kind of shit. Now, they actually did do uh, a medical exam on him. Now, they said that he seemed he had lost some weight. 
uh, because he said, well, he didn't remember much Mm -hmm. of anything, but, you know, obviously he hadn't really been eating that much over the past five days. They said, other than that, he seemed in very good health. Uh, The only two weird things they found were a small red spot at the crease of his right elbow, almost like a hypodermic injection site, although it wasn't on a vein. Okay. So um, it should be noted, no, there was no uh, evidence of drugs or anything like that in his system. So, you know, anybody that said, oh, he injected himself with something that had some kind of hallucination or something, evidently they didn't find any drugs in his system. They also said that his urine, which, you know, I guess Mm -hmm. they did check that. They said that it lacked ketones. They said that was strange because if he hadn't been eating for five days... And they said it seemed that he hadn't been because he'd mm-hmm. lost some weight. Then his body should have been breaking down fats and things like that to have calories to burn. And so there should have been very high ketone levels in his urine. But right. there was not. Uh, it was very low. So they thought that was very strange. But they couldn't figure out why that could be. So now comes the part where they ask Travis about what he remembered about the time he was missing. Now, like I said, yeah, he thought that he'd only been gone for a couple of hours and was kind of evidently was shocked that he found out that it had been five days. He said the last thing he remembered, he said, I remember being struck by the light. When he woke up, he was on a reclined bed, like kind of a hospital bed type of thing. Uh, He said there was a bright light above him. He said it was very hot. The air was very heavy. It was very muggy. He said he was in a lot of pain and didn't uh, had trouble breathing. But he said at first he thought he was just in a hospital, right? That something bad had happened to him and somebody had taken him to the hospital and he wasn't really sure what was going on. So he says as he starts to wake up, he sees three figures around him and they have orange jumpsuits on. And he said as he looked at them, he could see that they were not human. He said they kind of looked like, uh, they didn't call them greys back then, but Mm -hmm. but essentially that's what he described. Um, He said they were short, uh, under five feet. They were bald. You know, they had uh, domed heads, like big domed heads. They had big eyes. Their eyes were like brown with almost no whites. He said they looked like fetuses. Um, He said they had really small ears, noses, and mouths. Now, evidently at this point, He is freaking out because he's like, shit, it's aliens. I'm on an alien spacecraft. So he started yelling at them to get away from him. And he says right on a shelf near where the table was, there was like this glass looking cylinder thing. I don't know how big it was. And uh, he says he grabbed it and tried to break it so he could stab him. Now, from what I remember, there was something on his chest, though, too. When he got up, it fell off. Yeah, but that, I don't, it was, was like some kind of machinery or something like yeah, that. But I don't know if he ever really, like, was that knew in the, what that was. Was that in the original testimony? I think it was, yeah. Okay. Because the way it's always been pictured is like kind of like a curved metal implement over his chest. Yeah. Like they were, you know, some kind of machine to resuscitate him. Maybe. Or, yeah, or to keep been. him... I don't know. Keep him under control. But yeah. So he grabs this glass cylinder and he's trying to break it. It won't break. So then he just kind of waves it at him. Like, it's kind of threatening. And apparently they left the room. I don't think they, like, fled the room. Like, oh my God, oh no. So it wasn't glass. It must have been plastic. Yeah, I don't Uh, know. But he couldn't break it at any any rate. So then he goes out of the, like, exam room that he was in, which he thinks is what it was. And then out of the door, there's this other room and it's like round. It's like this spherical kind of room. And the only thing that's in there is sort of this high backed chair in the middle of the room. And he says, now he goes up to this chair, even though he thought maybe there would be someone in it. And he was kind of scared, but he goes up to it and he's like, and as he's going up to the chair, lights start coming on, like Mm -hmm. in the room, like they start appearing and there's no one in the chair. So he gets in it. And when he gets in the chair, the room starts filling up like a planetarium. Like yeah. he sees like a, like Stars. star maps, yeah. you know, just like in Prometheus when they have right. it. The, yeah, that kind of thing. So he sees that. Now he says on the arm of the chair, there's like um, a lever, or like a joystick type of thing. And he says, so when, and then there's like a little screen that was mm-hmm. like a little green computer screen. And he says he pushes the lever and all the stars start moving. Like mm-hmm. the star map that's around him starts moving around. So then he's like, well, I better not fuck with that because I don't know right. what else it's going to do. So he lets it go. Now, then he hears a noise behind him in the room and he turns around and he sees something that looks like a person. It mm. looks like a human. He says he's wearing a helmet and uh, he has like blue overalls on or coveralls like a jumpsuit. 
he said, now the guy did look human, but he had like weird eyes. Like they Mm. were bigger than a normal person's eyes and they were kind of like gold and shiny. Now he says he tried to talk to this person, but that the guy just kind of grinned at him. It wouldn't say anything. And then he tells Travis to follow him. Right. So Travis is like, okay. And he tells him this in English? Or he, well, I guess he gestured okay. for him to follow him. Because right. I don't think they he talked. Yeah, I don't remember them ever saying anything. Yeah, I don't think anybody talked to him. Uh, so that's what he says. So, so he follows this guy down this hallway. And then there's a door and a ramp. And it goes down to this other big room. And he said it looks like an aircraft hangar. So he says that now he's outside of the ship. He realizes he's outside of the ship. And he's looking around. And he sees um, the outside of the ship, and he said it looks just like the one that they saw in the forest before he ran toward it. But he says, now this, the craft that he just got off of is twice as large as the one they saw in the woods. Okay. So I don't know if it was the same or if they were just smallifying it, or I don't know what it was, or if this is a different one, they transferred him to the bigger ship. I don't know what it was. But he says this one was like twice as big as the one that picked him up. So 40, 50 feet in diameter. Yeah. But it has its own hospital on it. Yeah. He must... Maybe that's just the hospital shit. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. So I he gets maybe off... Maybe he just thinks it was a hospital. Yeah, so he, gets off in the, so he gets off in the hangar, and he says he sees other discs like in the hangar and stuff like that. Now he says, then the guy takes him into this other room, and then there's three more humans in there, what appear to be humans, um, two men and a woman, and they kind of look like the guy with the helmet on. It's like they have these mm-hmm. weird eyes and everything. They didn't have helmets on. Now, he says he starts talking to them and, like, asking him what the hell is going on. And then they he said the same thing. They just grinned at him and didn't say anything. And then he they led him over to this table. And they kind of sat him on the table. And then he said that the woman had um, something that looked like an oxygen mask. And she put it on his face. And then he passed out. And that was the last thing he remembered. He said the next time he woke up, he was at the gas station outside of Heber, Arizona, and was like, what the hell happened? Mm -hmm. And was going to call his family. Now, he says that when he got dropped off, evidently, Mm -hmm. by this gas station, he says that he saw the craft again up in the sky. As though it was like it left and it'd be like, good luck, man. You know what I mean? And then took off. So that's what he says. So that he thought that it had only been a few hours. And he's like, whoa, that was weird. Now, it should be noted, like I said, when they made the movie out of this, Fire Mm. in the Sky, in 1993, which is actually a good movie. It's pretty scary and stuff like that. But the whole sequence of him being on the ship is totally different. I mean, that pretty much has them straight up torturing him. They're putting that yucky goop that looks like Marmite or something, like, in his mouth. And they have that thing on his eye. They're putting, like, that... Yeah, that fucking the wet plastic, shit over the, him and the then, like, cutting it with it. So yeah. none of that happened. Like, right. nothing, apparently nothing terrible happened to him on there. It was just, like, unsettling. Yeah. Um, evidently, when they made the movie, the guy that was directing it felt bad mm-hmm. that they had had to do it. But he said, you know, the executive said it was too boring. Right. So we had to, like, spice that part of it up. And he actually wrote letters, like, apologizing to, other, like, ufologists right. and stuff like that, yeah. that he had to do that. He's like, I know I had to exaggerate it and shit like that. So Travis comes back, he tells them this story, and, you know, the police are kind of like, okay, whatever. But then they give him a polygraph test, too, Mm -hmm. and he passes it, although there's kind of like some other shit, too, where... Now, he underwent hypnosis, yeah, and they said, now, the interesting thing about him going under hypnosis is that his story when he was conscious and his story when he was under hypnosis were the same Mm -hmm. which i thought was kind of interesting because usually they can get stuff out of you but he didn't remember anymore under hypnosis okay um but he told the same story whether he was hypnotized or not so now the interesting thing is that even though travis you know even though the other guys had seen him get hit with this beam of light and apparently he hit the ground really hard and stuff like that but when they did the medical exam they didn't find any bruises um, his arm wasn't hurt, even though he landed on his arm and shoulder. He didn't seem to have any head trauma. He hadn't, he didn't have any drugs in his system or anything like that. So, there, you know, a lot of suspicion has been surrounding this story, even though all of the guys accounts have remained pretty consistent over the years. Now, it should be noted that as many polygraph tests as Travis Walton has taken, some of them he did fail. Okay. But... One of the more popular ones that he failed, uh, which was given by somebody named John McCarthy, and this was arranged by the National Enquirer, actually. (laughs) Okay. Now, there was a controversy about this because they think that McCarthy 
might have done the polygraph test, quote unquote, unprofessionally in right. that he specifically tried to ask upsetting or embarrassing questions to get him to, to come get up. him to right. come to, you know, to right. kind of get his emotional level right. spiking so that maybe he would fail the test. I don't know if that's the case or not, but he did um, fail that. And also in 2009, he was on some game show. I've never uh-huh. seen it or some reality show or something like that, where they have like people take lie detector tests. Mm-hmm. And he was asked, did you really get uh, abducted by aliens? And he said, yes. And it, the polygraph said that he was lying. Huh. But like I said, they might have just engineered that for the game show because it would be more shocking or whatever. I don't know. But most of the polygraphs that he took over the years, yeah. uh, apparently he has passed them. Although, you know, like I said, polygraphs, right. they're not 100% What's his accurate explanation? at any rate. What does he think happened? He seems to think that he was actually abducted by right. aliens. And honestly, all of the, his friends seem to think that as well. Or they're very good at telling the same story over the years and yeah. not slipping up. Because uh, apparently, as far as I know, you know, there are obviously still skeptics and are like yeah. trying to poke holes in his story and things like that. Like one guy said uh, the whole part where he was telling about the story about how he woke up on the table and then he mm. grabbed that glass cylinder yeah. thing and tried to fight them off. And he said, you know, a couple minutes before he said that. You know, he was talking about how in pain he was, how weak mm. he was. He's like, oh, and suddenly he had the energy to pick up this, like, convenient glass yeah. cylinder and, like, scare these aliens away by, like, just waving it at him and stuff like that. So there have been a lot of skeptics that have tried to poke holes in the story. And one of these, I think his name is Philip Class, if I'm remembering this correctly. He thinks that the motive, that th- this is a whole hoax that was mm. engineered by all these guys. He thinks that the reason for it was because Mike Rogers, who was, you know, his brother-in-law and he was uh, Mm. the foreman of the crew, Mm. uh, it was because he knew that he wasn't going to be able to finish the forestry job on time and he was afraid he was going to get in trouble. So he concocted this UFO story and this disappearance and everything like that so he could invoke the Act of God clause and he could get out of the contract without fault, okay? Mm. So they think that was the motive. The only thing about that is that... Even though Mike Rogers did say something about, mm. you know, even when Travis was still missing, he did make a statement like, oh, I guess I'm not going to finish the job now or mm. anything like that. But maybe it'll be mitigated by, you know, Travis being missing and all of the search going on. Um, but he never did try to invoke that. And evidently he had had unfinished contracts a couple times before and they still hired him. So, so it's not like it was a big huge so deal. Did they get anything out of this story? Really not a lot. I mean, obviously, a couple years after it happened, Travis Walton wrote a book, which Mm -hmm. was called The Travis Walton Experience, is now called Fire in the Sky. He renamed it Mm -hmm. Fire in the Sky uh, after the movie came out, so the two things would be uh, associated. You know, I don't know how much Mm -hmm. money he's made out of that. Uh, He does speak at various UFO conferences and stuff like that. He's a minor celebrity in the The UFO world. The thing is, though, is that on that work crew... Yeah. Backing this story up was a guy who didn't know any of these other guys. That's the See, thing, this is, that and kind he didn't of, get anything out of it. Yeah, it, it's weird. What it what it sounds like to me sounds like if this is true, if this really did happen, the meaning of the story, from what I can get up get out of it, is that Travis Walton runs underneath a UFO, all right, an alien spacecraft. This alien spacecraft tries to get away from him. You know, maybe it's under orders. Don't contact those humans. As it lifts up. Uh, an arc of lightning or electric electrical energy comes out of it and accidentally hits Travis and kills him. Everybody else runs away. The aliens go, damn, we accidentally killed that guy. Oopsie. Yeah. <laughs> we got to fix him. So they pick him up. They put him in a ship. Uh, for five days, they work on him and revive him. Heal up everything. All the little damage from the fall. You know, no bruising and all that. He wakes up too early. He sees aliens and attacks them. Tries to escape the ship. But they use some kind of mind control device to get him back under control. So he no, he doesn't see the aliens as aliens anymore. He sees them as kind of human-like things. And they uh, can manipulate him and get him to sit down. And then they knock him back out again until he's done. Then they drop him off. That kind of fits with the story that he's talking about. Right. Because I don't think that he's going to go on an alien craft and see things that look kind of like people. I'm, I'm not Yeah, that, that seemed a very unusual. You got some things that look like aliens and other things that look like people. Yeah. All right. But he only sees the things that look like people after he sees the aliens and after he freaks out. 
So I think he freaked out when he saw the aliens, and then the aliens hit him with some kind of control, some kind of mind control device, you know, which uh, calms him down. And in his mind, these aliens look a lot like people. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then they don't talk to him. Yeah. They just, just, they just kind of like grin so at him you, and if, don't say if anything. If this happened, maybe that's what yeah. we're talking about. Now, it should be noted, and a lot of skeptics have said this, that not long before this incident... Mm -hmm. There had been a TV movie or some kind of a special that had aired on television that was about the Betty and Barney Hill abduction. Mm -hmm. And even though Travis Walton says he didn't watch it, Mike Rogers did watch it. Mm -hmm. So some people are saying, well, this was all Mike Rogers and he came up with this scheme after seeing the movie about the Betty and Barney Hill abduction. But the thing is, okay, here's the thing. This is before Cable. Yeah. Now, yeah. what's the th now? If it was a hoax, like you said, yeah. did they really? I mean, Travis kind of benefited from it, I guess, because mm -hmm. he wrote a book, and I guess it did okay, and they made mm -hmm. a movie out of it, and everything like that. Like I said, I don't know how much money he made out of it. Probably not. I much. don't know if the other guys got anything out of it. Did they do it? You know, I, it just doesn't seem believable to me that they would concoct something that complicated. Just to like get out of a contract or something like that. Well, that one and guy, that one guy who had only known them for like three or four days, he's still alive. And recently, you know, I've seen interviews with him recently, you know, the past couple of years. He hasn't seen those guys in years and years and years. And he still stands by that story. And he's pretty upset about it, what it looks like. Something happened, I think. Yeah. I, think I mean, happened. I'm not saying. I'm going to go on record. Like, I don't necessarily think they're hoaxing because, because yeah. why? It would have come out by now. If it's a, ho if it's a hoax, it it's seems an excellent like, hoax. Yeah. It, it seems like a dumb thing to hoax about unless it was one of those things where it's just like they did it for shits and giggles and didn't think anyone would believe them. And then everybody did. And they were like, well, shit, now we're like stuck with it forever yeah. because we don't want to look like we made it yeah. up. That's feasible. Uh, yeah. Do I think he was really taken on board an alien spacecraft? I don't think so. Mm. Do I think that he believed? that he was it does seem like he does believe that he was i don't think yeah. that he was right i think that but i think maybe something bad happened to him that made him think that um, my mind's i'm gonna keep my mind open i don't know for sure I'm oh just yeah say, i don't know either it's yeah. it's possible that he could have got taken out i i tend to be very skeptical of people that get abducted yeah. by aliens it, but his story is so the story is weird very, and it's yeah. so unlike any other abduction story like, they didn't really do anything bad to him. His story is actually kind of simple. Yeah, not a yeah. lot happened. Not it's just kind of he woke up. Like you said, it was almost kind of like they accidentally killed him or accidentally hurt right. him and was like, oh, shit, we got to we gotta fix it and then we'll put him back and hopefully he won't remember anything. I would think that if you woke up in an alien spacecraft, what you would see inside there, that environment, would be very alien. Yeah. I wouldn't think it would be so familiar. You yeah, know, humanoid type creatures. But who am I? Who am I? Yeah, you know, maybe, maybe that's why I kind of think. Who am I though? Maybe yeah. they are very similar to us. That's why I kind of think yeah. maybe. So well, the thing is though, if it if he wasn't taken by aliens and it wasn't a hoax, then what happened to him? I mean, you know, people might say, oh, he got struck by lightning, but it's like, yeah, but if he got struck by lightning, then they would have found him when they went back out. To find him, He's, unless he wandered off someplace. It was someplace. only five days prior, so he still would have been fucked up. A lightning bolt will fuck you up. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. He would have been messed up. Right. I mean, and I would think that if you got struck by lightning, that they would be able to tell that only five days later. I think what the story is supposed to be. Why didn't he be, freeze to it's death? It's supposed to be a story of a guy accidentally killed by a flying saucer. They abduct him and fix him. Bring him back to life and fix him and let him go five days later. That's the story. All right. Whether or not that actually happened. I don't know. Something happened. Yeah. I respect that. If that's a hoax, I respect that hoax. Like I said, yeah. if, if it's a hoax, they committed to that yeah. shit. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> and I kind of I, I I've dig seen that. I've that's seen cool. I've seen the interviews and they, uh, they they sound sincere to me and they've been sticking to that story for a long time without and they're not really gaining anything from it. Not really. I they mean, don't other, see each other other anymore. than getting to be on TV every now every and then or getting then. on a. You know, and I don't that think gets anyone, old quick. Yeah, that's what yeah, I mean. It's not like you get to be just like, like shit. oh shit, I gotta go to the studio. Man, fuck this studio. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. It's like you know, yeah, I get to be on radio shows sometimes too, yeah. but it's like you know, like so what? Yeah, it's not really that yeah. big a deal. I'm mostly yeah. just sitting here talking on Skype. It's not really that. Ex it's not glamorous. It's better when we're controlling it. Well, going, going into the studio in there, and you know, going to the studio was kind of cool. 
I, yeah, I had a good time. I yeah. sat I sat in there, too, and tried to be quiet the yeah. whole time. But uh, I think yeah. you did good. I don't uh, know how long it's going to be before that show comes out, because she's uh, going to have to edit it and stuff like that. But it's it's, gonna, I bet you it's going to be ridiculous. It's not going to be ridiculous. Right. It's going to be good. <laughs> don't be that way. I was getting kind of wound up at certain times of it. Yeah, I know. Of, but, yeah. you know, it, it'll be good. It'll be yeah. good. But Ask we'll let, we'll let everybody... Feel. What Ask I know. I'm getting so skinny. I know we're both we're both losing. We've been on a diet. I must have lost I've been on a diet pounds. since the end of January. Yeah, middle so of January. Let's wrap this up. Yeah, it's been over an hour now. So we. It, yeah. So the thing is, like I said, I'm not saying one way or the other. I, tech, really, I don't think he was taken by aliens. I mean, yeah, it's possible. I don't. I don't think it was. But I don't necessarily think it's a hoax either. I think something bad happened to him, and maybe that's how he interpreted it. I'm just gonna say it's a good story. It is a very good story. It's a good story. story. It's a good case. Probably one of the most famous UFO yeah, abduction cases. I, I mean, other than the Betty and Barney Hill story. I don't know if it actually happened, but the, but there's there's a chance that it did. But there's also a chance that it that, that, that didn't happen. You know, logic and reason are going to say that, well, most likely it didn't happen. Yeah. You know, odds are it didn't happen. But maybe it did. So, you know, I'm just going to, you know, I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah, we're yeah, we're, sta- we're staying on the fence Maybe. on this one. <laughs> I'm not gonna worry about it. It's a it's a good story. It is, yeah. yeah. All right, so we're gonna wrap this show up. Uh, don't you guys get kidnapped by any aliens? Yeah. In the meantime, but uh, <laughs> remember. Yeah. Remember, if you like the show, to like, share, subscribe, and share on all your social media. Tell your friends about us, everything like that. If you'd like to financially support the show, then go to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash 13 o'clock or go to our blog, which is 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com. And there's a link in the sidebar to a PayPal account where you can give a one-time donation, which you may do if you so desire. Also, check out our last movie review, which is The Fog. And if you're uh, using a podcast app to listen to the audio, episodes uh all of our movie reviews should be available in audio only format now i'm not really sure how all of the podcast apps work but i did upload all of them in audio format so be sure to look out for those i don't know how long it takes to update or whatever but uh they are all up there for your listening enjoyment also remember to check out our zazzle store at zazzle.com 13 o'clock and where we have uh several t-shirts and a tote bag that you can purchase and that'll do it for episode 86 about the travis walton ufo case we will see you next tuesday bye